So our next speaker is, when I told him he was going on after Heather, he was very, <laughs> very gracious about the whole thing. And, and I, I did say to him, Eric, we're putting you on after Heather because we have faith in you. <laughs> so I can't thank Eric enough for coming on next. Eric Novak from MNM Perspectives, please welcome him to the stage. Put her back on, she says. Well, oh, it's not. Are we there? There. Eric's going to share his story, My Three Epiphanies of Living, Legacy, and Communication. Well, thank you. Wow. That's quite the act to follow. You know, I, I have spoken, speaking is a lot of what I do in my living, but i got to tell you, I don't care where I've been how many times, every time I see my name up there like that, it's just so, so cool. So I just have to say that. Um, on this coming Sunday, I am going to be celebrating my... 3012th birthday. 42 if you need to go the other way. You have to think about that. And, and in my, my 3012 years, I've actually experienced quite a lot, really uh, a lot of experiences and occasions and momentums that I, I remember a lot. But in the time that I have with you today, I just want to focus on the last 10 because in those last 10, um, I've had moments in my life, these three major epiphanies that I call them of, of, of living, of legacy, and of communication that really have shape me into who I am today and actually allow me to be standing on this stage in front of you and speaking in the relative context of what this is all about today. Uh, the first epiphany I had, and for someone who is ADD, I can remember these dates, it's really quite astounding. Um, my first epiphany was at 9.34 p.m. on Friday the 26th of July 2002. And that's when I became a parent. And that was the, uh, the moment my first, my eldest son, Adam, was born. Show of hands, how many of you are parents? You know that feeling, right? The feeling that hit me after I stopped freaking out because he was 10 pounds, 12 ounces, 21 and a half inches long, and I swear I almost thought about rolling him in school that September. But, but I, I mean, I swear, this guy's a monster. But I was really hit in the wall, just this brick, virtual brick hit me in the face that basically made me understand that my life, from that nanosecond forward, really until the day that I die, it's no longer about me. The Eric Novak selfish era of my life ended and the selfless era began. Now, I've had two sort of satellite epiphanies since then. Uh, at 8.21 and 8.22 a.m. on Sunday, May 23rd, 2004, my, sons, my twin sons were born, uh, Matthew and Jacob. And uh, at 4.43 p.m. on Friday, September the 4th, 2009, I finally got my girl. My daughter, Isabel, was born. Being a parent is one of the most unbelievable epiphanies you can ever have because you realize that everything changes. There's now a responsibility that you never had before. The, the understanding of, of the, the role you play as a parent that you willfully, and you may think not, but you willfully got into to love, support, provide, comfort, protect, leave a home. And these are things that really hit me strong. I feel this great sense of responsibility to my family, my children. Actually, I bring this up because one of my sons, my, uh, my Asperger's twin, Jacob, feels that he always has a responsibility. Whenever I travel somewhere, he always feels that I need something of him to remember by. So this is, um, this is slushy. I actually had to call my wife home to remember his name because uh, my last trip I had fishy and then there was squishy and, and I just, you know, he's got this massive wall. So, but, uh, so, so if you wonder what he's doing here, slushy is here because Jacob tells me he should. Um, the next major epiphany kind of rolls into the next one because that's my epiphany of life, but legacy. And, and I don't remember the exact moment, but I remember it was a Saturday night in 2006 when the next epiphany hit me. And it happened the very moment after I watched An Inconvenient Truth. My wife and I sat and watched the movie on a Saturday night. And at the end of it, I couldn't help but just be furious. I was absolutely mad. I couldn't sleep. I thought about the messaging in there. And I began to say to myself, what happened here? How did we live in a society that all of a sudden developed a very myopic way of thinking? How did we grow up suddenly realizing that we should only live for the moment? When did we forget the words of the Native American proverb that says, 
one generation, we haven't inherited this planet from our ancestors, rather we're only borrowing it from our children. What happened? When did we forget the Chinese proverb that says one generation plants the tree, the next get the shade? I just, I couldn't understand how in, in just 50 or 60 years we began to forget that the greater good is more significant than the perceived greatness of having goods. And so what do I do? I got mad and, and, and the activist has always been in me. My mom was raised that way and I was raised that way as the apple doesn't fall from the tree. So I figured out what I can do. And I found out that, that Mr. Gore sort of uh, created this group called the Climate Project and he's training people around the world to give his presentation and he was coming to Canada. So I did everything I could. I cashed in every favor I could to be part of the group. And in April of 2008, I was in Montreal and I was in an audience of 200 others and I was being personally trained by Mr. Gore and Dr. David Suzuki. And this is as a volunteer too. And I committed that I'm gonna go and educate people and make them think. And in the two and a half years since, I've spoken to close to 20,000 people all across the country. The vast majority of them students, teaching them about the paradigm shift between entitlement and ownership. Because we can't feel entitled anymore. We can't think to ourselves that someone else is going to fix the problem. The problem has to be ours, whether we created it or not. And that's a major epiphany in my life. So now we keep rolling, because these epiphanies keep rolling into each other. I think, well, what's next? Well, I had this epiphany of communication. And it's weird because I own a media company. I've been 20 years in the industry. I've, I've been in radio. I've had TV shows. But this thing called social media took over and is raging everywhere. And, and actually, I had to do a bit of research because if you, if you actually, nobody even talks about what the definition of the word media is. If you go in the dictionary, media is simply the plural of medium. All media has ever been is a method to communicate a message. You know, if, if I'm speaking to the choir right now, your media, if you go and sing, and, and this whole idea of social media, Twitter and Facebook and, and blogging, and I didn't want to. I've, I've written. I write for newspapers and such. But then I remember I do some auto journalism too, and I went out to Vancouver for General Motors. Adrian's still around here. We're doing this thing called Catch the Vibe, and I had to do this online thing, and they gave me this black, white pearl, and there was this thing called Twitter I had never heard about, but I tried it, and I didn't understand quite why I had to tell the world that... I was feeling nauseous about tweeting on the Sea to Sky Highway and I needed to go to a shopper's drug mart or something like that, but I tried it anyway and, and I kept going on and I got the hang of it and this Facebook, people kept friending me things and I said, you're already my friend, but I eventually got it. And then I, uh, I, 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 uh, I met with a good friend, someone who I'd known who had written, who'd, uh, written for a book that I did, uh, someone we all know, Erica M., who I, I wrote a piece for on her website about how my wife trained our toilet trained our twins in a week and in, in the march and why I called her a superhero and I asked if I could ever help you some more and she said hmm you know we need a daddy blogger <laughs> I thought I don't want to blog I don't like this blogging thing what do I what could I offer but if you know anything about Erica M she when she asks a question she hears two answers she hears yes and she hears yes <laughs> so well, suddenly I became who's your daddy and and some, I was, I was, what did Sharon say? I'm, I'm uh, dishing about the dirty diatribes of daddy number or something like that. But, but I, so now I had this, I'm learning the social media platform. And then again, another sort of epiphany rolls into the mix when someone said to me, you know, Eric, hang on a minute. So you're this um, media guy, you're this uh, dad guy, you're this environmental guy. Nobody's really put that all together. I don't know, really, that's true. So we began the thinking process, and earlier this year I launched the latest sort of epiphany in communication. It's called envirodad.com. And envirodad.com is basically, in my attention, to be a resource for anybody who is a parent who understands that stewardship of our Mother Earth is, is part of being a parent. Well, here's where you go. We review autos and, and talk about tips and ideas and encourage stewardship of our planet. And it's all sort of leading to the next stage and to another stage after that. And the epiphanies continue to grow. And I think about, you know, I heard recently there was a saying that someone regretted how there's too, not enough time between epiphanies and epitaphs. Well, I'm, since I'm only 30, 12, I probably have a lot of time to go. And, and, I, and I live my life going forward with these epiphanies, understanding this one saying that, I, that I've used a lot before. You may have heard it before. And I'll close on this. It's, it's how do you live your dash? In the past tense, it will be read, how did you live your dash? There's universality all around the world, no matter where you live, no matter what culture or faith you belong to, when your time comes to leave this earth, 
there's, there's going to be some similarity between how you're remembered. There's always going to always be some sort of a marking. And you'll always see the year that you're born and the year that you die. But in between that, it's a dash. And that dash represents every thought you've had, every action you've taken, every word you've ever spoken. So ask yourself right now, how are you living your dash? Because you don't want to be thinking the wrong way afterwards. How did you live your dash? And my commitment myself, as I became a parent, as I became an environmentalist, is that when my stone is etched, and on one side it says 1969, and the other side it says 20 whatever, in between I want it to be a plus sign. And not a minus. Because by God, those however many years in between better amount for something. And if you share that journey, if you share that belief to live your dash right, live your epiphanies within your dash, and be part of the transformation that we can all do through social media and every other method possible. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. See, I knew we picked right to put Eric on next. <laughs> thank you, Eric.